with you. And also with him. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, 100 drugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generations than all the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the rich, true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The glory the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Please be seated.
I thought it was something else going on before I spoke. I thought they were going to dance or get or sing again, but it's okay. It's okay. Good morning and praise the Lord to you all. I bring you greeting this morning from the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How long would this day have been a blessed day for each and every one of us? It is great to be here for homecoming. Do you know some 70 some years ago, I started in St. Philip's United Methodist Church. I started to say 81, which I am now, but I didn't know when my mother got me, had me baptized, but I do know from the age of 10, we walked from baby to St. Philip's in a Costco. Sometimes we had rides from the makers, sometimes we had rides from the pastors. Then in the evening time, we walked back home. Back then, it wasn't a whole lot of traffic. We might saw one car, so we played along the way. So I was the oldest one, so you know I was the one got in trouble. So my two brothers were younger, so they would stop and play in the bridge. Remember that bridge down the Black Swamp where you used to watch cars at? And so I said, y'all better come on, because we're going to get in trouble. If I had left them behind, I would have been in bigger trouble. So time they got home, their pants were still wet, shoes and then hey. So you know who got in trouble. That was a glorious time. Do you understand? That was a good, some 80 some years ago, I did not know God had planted this spirit in my heart. I didn't know he was going to send the Holy Spirit that I'll be up speaking. I didn't know that I wouldn't have to go to West or anywhere, for he would agree to my heart. And I come thanking all those who was at St. Philip's at that time. Mother Ruby Grove. Some call her mother. Some call her aunt. Some call her friend. Some call her sister. You know, that planted and deposited things in my spirit. All those who came along with St. Philip's, all her family, all other uh, family that I can't even name today. Some Magruder, some Brooks's. Some, you know, just all turners, all kinds of people that deposit in my spirit. So I'm excited today. And then I turn around and look, Hey, Asbury United Methodist Church is behind me. They didn't say they was coming today. They said they was going to be hurt today. And then I remember Asbury, we, we would, the whole church would come down in the evening for St. Philip's homecoming. They cook all this good food we ate and then sang all to eat. Have a great time. So homecoming should mean something to you today. Yes. It will just reach deep down in your spirit and let you know what God has done. And look how far he had brought us. Yes. Then you turn around and look. They got Brother Tyrone Johnson here sending a message over every day. <laughs> every day you have a message.
people come today because I was rooting people for homecoming. Not because God would give me a ticket in heaven, not because he would make me excited, but these people down here in this area of Baden, Maryland, are working hard and striving to keep a church on. Amen. They are bringing praises and things in every day to keep a church on. And you had a word after I get saved, Pastor Johnson. I get down, I think, what are you going to talk about today? It's always something interesting. Then we got friends here from Asbury. I'm telling you, this is just a blessed day. But you got to me too fast, I wrong this month. I was sitting back trying to enjoy this day. Then I saw my uh, daughter-in-law and her daughters come out here dancing. I said, my, my, my God. What a great, mighty God we serve. That you can have mother and daughter dancing together, and the father and the husband sitting back watching, then the granddaughter come running, oh, praise God, somebody better start running this morning. You got a praise up in here. Then you got this daughter, Hick and Cheryl and all of them, Mr. Rich, I mean, just I can't name everybody. I clear I wouldn't say I wouldn't cry this morning, but you know, my heart is a touch. I got up excited. Excited for the day he let me rise this morning. And I say, if I can do the message, it's all right, because Pastor Johnson will take it over. <laughs> I already saw how he read. I said, well, he read it. He all right. He can take care of it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, we, we are, it's, it's a great day in the Lord. Amen. And I have been blessed by this church and blessed by this family, the grosses and all who came up in this church, all planted things in my spirit. And then after we grew up in the same community, I think we rode the same bus. I don't know where I was older or not, but we're not even gonna talk about that this morning. <laughs> but it's just been exciting. Exciting as the friends and people that I've met on the way. So now I guess it's time that I will start the service. The theme St. Phyllis had today, you cannot serve God and wealth, come from Luke 1 through 13, the scripture. I just entitled it, The Unjust Manager. Now you're gonna hear the scripture be read again because I think it's best that I read the scripture before I try to explain some things today because I'm just so excited. Pastor Johnson, have a standby, because you may have to come on up. <laughs> Jesus tells this parable of the shrewd manager, because he was talking to the disciples. He wanted the disciples to know about life and how things happen. So he always told a lot of parables in the, in the Bible. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting employees' money. Now you know what would pop in our mind if somebody told us that somebody wasting our money? Uh -huh. It would have been a disaster on the street. <laughs> but in this way, Jesus said, no, no. The manager was wasting the employees' money. So the employer called him and said, what I hear about you, Get your report, I order, because you are going to be fired. Wow, what happens? What happens today? What happens today? All the disasters and the action that you hear when somebody fired somebody, they don't act like Jesus did or the disciples. They get all upset, but then Jesus got a different story here for us today. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. I am too proud to beg. I know how to endure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employee to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. 
So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly charge it to 400 gallons. Mm -hmm. How much do you owe my employee? He asked the next man. I owe 1,000 bushels of wheat. Was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and quickly change it to 800 bushels. What's going through your mind at this time? Somebody had trusted you. Let's think about what's going through your mind at this time. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And, it's so, and it is true that the children of the world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Now, many explanations have been offered for this difficult story. The most likely is that the use of our money is a good test of the depth of our commitment to follow Jesus. Here we learn three things. Our money belongs to God, not us. We must use our resources wisely. God owns us. He owns our resources, our bank accounts, our jobs. God owns everything. So see, he was trying to do something that he thought God didn't know. But all he was doing was make it bad for himself. Money can be used for good or evil. We must use ours for good. Money has a lot of power. A lot of power money has. We must use it carefully and thoughtfully. When we live by God's kingdom priority, we will use our money and resources in a way that we will grow our own faith and obedience. God said, you must have faith in me. Now in 12, Luke 12, 33, 34, it says, sell your possessions and give to those in need. Now you all have to evaluate that. Because I know you're saying, I'm not telling all my time. <laughs> and give it to anybody. But you read it and meditate on that. This will store up treasures for you in heaven, and the persons of heaven never get old or develop hope. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it, and not moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasures is, there is the desire of your heart will also be. So if your treasure is down here on earth, that's where it's going to stay. But if your treasure is in heaven, you'll have eternal home with Jesus Christ. Now in John 12, 36, it says, your trust in the light while there is still time, you may become children of the light. Ephesians 5, 8 says, for once you were full of darkness. We all are full of darkness. None of us come, see, some of us think we come out religious, the holler, hear all this stuff. We don't do none of that thing. We got to crawl and bed, we got to do all kind of things before we get up here. I didn't come from St. Philip 70 and 80 some years ago, hollering, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I was a child growing up being the positive things in my life. I had to go through trials and tribulations with family and friends and a job. So young people don't think that that happens overnight. Don't think that you can get a good job or go to Capitol Hill like the senators and all and do wrong and stand high. It don't happen like that. Don't happen like that. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. That means anything you do in the dark will come to light. Yes. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Yes. Live like you're people of light. Respect, enjoy. When there's a problem, talk about it. You can't fight a problem, but you can be kind to the problem. That old devil has to sit down because he don't have nothing to fight. He can't fight with you. 
So when you go on these jobs and to walk around, you know how it is, this old racist thing that come all back, double. Oh, yeah. You can see in the eyes they don't like you, but they want you to work. <laughs> but they want you to say, do what I say, not what I ask. Yeah. See, if they would turn that thing around, if they would just turn that thing around and say, oh, could you? Yeah. Would you? I love what you've done down there. Yeah. But see, it's not in them, so we got to keep praying. Yeah. We got to keep praying, church. But we must live as people of life. When they act like that, we need to show our life. Amen. Show our life. Amen. Here are the lessons. 16.9, it says, here are the lessons. Use your world of resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. That means you don't go to squandering your, your, your employees' money. You don't go out trying to steal. You don't go out try, just trying to get over. And I'm going to say this, and it's okay because we all church folks in here. When you have a leadership job in your church and the finance office of whatever leadership you have, walk as children of light. Don't matter what somebody else is doing, you walk in light, show your light, and God will tell them that. But some of them, some of them old boys are still hanging on because they think they're going to have eternal life. But their eternal life is going to be right here because when the people of light welcome them into the kingdom, it's not going to be the same kingdom that we walk in. Amen. 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 And I hope that you all know. Now, we are, we are to make wise use of the financial opportunities that we have. Not to earn a ticket to heaven, but to help people find Jesus. You don't know your money can help people find Jesus. You know you can give people a basket of fruit that they have never had. They would want to see you again. They would want to talk to you again. They want to know where your heart is. They want to know how you get where you are. They want to know why you're driving that. How do you drive that? You don't, what's going on here? See, that's the opportunity. To tell them what God has done for me. If I could tell you what God has done for me today, whoo, you could not stay here that long. You could not. I drove, oh, drove an old car with wheels half falling down, smiling, great, happy, enjoying. Then I got a new car. What happened? It broke down. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what served me? That old car served me. So see, we can't always reach up for those new things. But now we have to take our time. And you know, then I, I think I word my son. I know he's going to get down and tell this except him back then. I, word him. I, I want this Cadillac. I, he, he didn't, wasn't too much on it. Well, I, we went to the deal and we went and got this Cadillac and all. That thing wasn't worth two cents. <laughs> and, then, and he kept saying, I said, well, you can put a motor. He said, no. <laughs> I said, well, he said, no. I said, well, I already called the man at mine hall. I called him. And he said he got a motor. Uh, and he'll put it in. He said, no. So I said, well, the answer is no. So I had to go and get a car. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So I said, Lord, I guess I have to move on because if he ain't going to do it, I can't do it. <laughs> so see, sometimes we have to act like the children of life. I have to back up and say, now what am I going to do? Huh? If we use our money to help those in need or to help others find Jesus, our earthly investors will bring internal benefit. And you all know that because every one of you in here have helped somebody and are still helping somebody. And I'm still sending the word. If you don't have the money, you're sending the word. Look, I looked at last Saturday. Were y'all here last Saturday? That how they helped somebody. Were y'all here when they had the dentist and that? It was people lined up around here just wanting to help somebody. That's what I'm talking about, children of life. That's how God did other things in our heart. And I said, wow, I didn't even have to buy dinner. But you promised God that 
you would help somebody. You promised God that you would live like the children of light. So I bought my dinners happily and small does not let me. When we obey God's will, the unselfish use of possessions will follow. You hear that? The unselfish use of possessions will follow. You have seen a many selfish person. And where are they? Still sitting on the corner being selfish? <laughs> but they'll tell you, man, I'm just waiting because I'm going up young. But they don't know how far they going up young. <laughs> See, they got to remember. How far are you going? Is you going to stop on the lower level? Or is God standing there and saying, come on in, your faithful servant. We got to be careful about things like that. Amen. How we talking, use our tongue, saying things that we shouldn't say. Okay, now, verse 10. I'm not going to be long, Brother Johnson, but hold on. <laughs> if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. Now, who would hire you if they knew you were dishonest? No one. But sometimes we take goodness and the grace of God and your credentials and your lifestyle. They say, they are right, hard. Well, you won't know to like some of the big corporations downtown to the man had went out and bought a yacht, bought a boat, bought his family houses. Then the employees didn't have money to use what they wanted. They didn't know he was dishonest, so they trusted him. For years, they trusted him. You understand me? They trusted him. Just like you would trust somebody. You trusted him to find out all your possessions is gone. And you have nothing for your employees. You have to get on your knees and call on Jesus. Send something. Send me a trustworthy person. And some of the institutions are still suffering. Some of the churches are still suffering. But people just don't want to do right. They take up other people's credentials and money and walk off and have the church out. Hallelujah, I know God. And don't listen or hear from it because if they knew they wouldn't do that. So we have to be careful even when we have business and things. Who do we hire? Or keep a watch on something that you have. And if you are unworthy about worldly wealth, things of this world, you will trust, you will, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? How God going to trust us with all the riches he has? You know how many riches God said have up there? Yeah. You know what he's saying? The streets of gold and all this kind of stuff. He can't bring us up there if he can't trust us. He had to send you somewhere while it's smoking downstairs. <laughs> and you won't feel so good. But you remember, remember the story in Luke? Where did Lazarus lay outside the gate? And all the rich men passed by. And he had to beg and eat crumbs. Yeah. All of them thought they was going to heaven. Yeah. And when they got there and felt the scorching heat, they say, oh, call my brothers and tell them. Tell them that they have to change their life. It's too late then. Yes. Yes. You have all this time to get your life together. You have all this time to walk as children of light. You hear God's message every day. Stop ignoring his word. And if you're not faithful with other people's things, 
Why should you be trusted with things of your own? How about that? You ever had things that waste you? You just waste things? You just waste things because you got it? You know, I, 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 when I got a few pennies in my purse, I used to go out and want to buy, go to McDonald's. Why well, I want McDonald's food? <laughs> and I go to home. Why was spending that time? Then I go out and say, whew, I'm gonna get a salad. I call up and hey, but where y'all going today? Y'all going up to eat this? Ah, oh, we might go to uh, whatever, cheddar or whatever. Go then, we're unsatisfied and unhappy. <laughs> but who fault was it? Our fault. <laughs> so we stopped there. Our fault. So yesterday I was coming down for Clinton. I said, whoo, I would like to have a salad. Well, I passed one place. I said, well, I'll just go ahead and walk up. <laughs> then when I got to Brandon White, I said, you know, Lord, that's foolish thinking. Mm -hmm. I got stuff home in my refrigerator to make a salad. Mm -hmm. So I went home and made a great big salad and wasn't even hungry, didn't even eat it. So what would happen to the salad? <laughs> <laughs> See, we got to stop and start thinking, stop wasting stuff. We just waste stuff, waste our money. And then we say we don't have any. We got to stop wasting stuff. Think about that. Our integrity is often put on the line in money matters. God calls us to be honest, even in small details. We could easily ignore heaven's riches are far more valuable than earthly wealth. But if we are not trustworthy with our money here, no matter how much or how little we have, we will be unfit to handle the vast riches in God's kingdom. And that is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Sometimes instead of we want to put money in the plate, we go buy a dress. But you know, that's because the window. We don't do that no more. Because we go to the thrift store. <laughs> and it looked nobody would ever know. Because I look the same, I'm the same her. You know, and things like that. So we have to remember that there is more riches in the kingdom of heaven that we can ever have down here on earth. Amen. See that we maintain your integrity in all matters, both big and small. We are finally to verse 13, which is your theme here. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and his slave to money. Well, you know, until you get to reading and learn that thing, Pastor John, until you put that all in your life, you don't even understand that. Because you look at it and say, what are you talking about? But you know what? That is a true thing. Money has the power to take God's place in our life. We can take the money and put it in God's place in our life. We can get up in the morning, think about nobody but ourselves, but buy, buy get, what can I have, how can I trick this person out of a dollar, how can I do this over there. See, we don't want our minds go back there with Satan. We want to walk like the children of light. So if we get up in the morning, Amen. don't have our mind on money. I'm going to tell you something. I'm saying, if these people here at St. Phillips had nothing but money on their mind, they wouldn't even be here. They wouldn't even be here. You don't know how they work and pray and give and thank for God to keep blessing down here. Keep blessing. The doors are open. The lights are on. Because they didn't go down the street and take their money and give it to somebody else. They gave it to Christ. They gave it to Christ. We can become we, we can become your master. Let me read this statement over again. I don't want to double talk about that. Money has the power to take God's place in your life. It can become your master. 
How can you tell if you are a slave to money? Oh, I have to answer these questions, though. Y'all can just write these down. Take home for y'all. All y'all have to answer these questions. Yeah, yeah. Old, young, whatever. Got money, don't have any, whatever. You can have to answer these questions. How can you tell if you are a slave to money? <clears throat> Ask yourself these questions. Do I think and worry frequently about money? Oh, what's happening on my mind? Oh my gracious, so what am I do? What am I do? No. I'll ride out on a half side together and say, well, I'll get home. <laughs> I went to Asbury once. Long time ago. Years ago. And I had gas. I thought I had gas. <laughs> so when I got to go home, I said to myself, Ooh, I don't know how I'm going to get there because I don't have no ducats in my pocket. So the kids was graduating by then. It might have been some of your money, Greg, I don't know. <laughs> the children was graduating back then. Then the guy walked up and said, oh, you know, I didn't give your, your child this for graduation. I thought, oh, well, pray <laughs> He didn't know what was going on. I said, well, nobody had to know but me and Jesus. Me and Jesus. See, y'all got to go me and Jesus. Hey. So, you know, things happen in our life like that. That means what? Your girl see the deposit and stuff. Do I give up doing what I should do or would like to do in order to make more money? Hmm? Hello. <laughs> That 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 goes a signal. I take when I when I retire, you know, you know, when you retire, people tell you you're gonna make so much money. They tell you in the, in the office. I don't know what they told you, little baby, but they told me in the office that I'd make so much money. But you know, when I got the check, I say, well, somebody that made a mistake. <laughs> so, so I called down to the office. She said, but we didn't tell you that. We told you you're gonna have it. We didn't tell you you're gonna get this. I said, well, I I said, oh boy, what are you going to do? I didn't tell the kids, like, I'm going to have to get a job. I'm going to look for a job for a year. And they said, ain't nobody going to hire you. <laughs> and you retired at 70 years old, and you can look for somebody to hire you. Well, I just went on, I said, oh, I got to have a job. Then I had to sit down and put Jesus at the table with me. Yes. He said, look, you worked 41 years.
today we will share again that we shared at the anniversary a few months back of our friend Henry, the mouse. <laughs> Henry is still with us 146 years later. This story, the history of St. Philip's, was told uh, to Miss Bernice Mako and Mil Millicent Mason years ago, and this uh, history book was put together here. And please uh, bear with me. This is Henry speaking. <clears throat> One day, as I was roaming around the countryside near the little town of Woodville, I saw a building. The sign in front of it read, St. Mary's Episcopal Church. I went inside and looked around in wonderment. To my surprise, it was filled with people. I noticed that all of the people sitting in the front were white, and all of the people that were brown were sitting in the back. I didn't understand it, but I later learned that it was because of their color, the brown people were not allowed to sit in the front. I looked at myself. Since I was brown, I quietly moved to a corner in the back of the church with the brown people. I went to church every Sunday, I enjoyed with my brown friends. I began to arrive early so that I could watch them as they entered. I sat quietly in my little mouse corner and watched the sadness and pain on their faces and they carefully found a place to sit. They had no books for song or prayer. Even without books, they were able to sing and pray anyway. They looked happy when they were singing. They knew God was watching over them. I listened, and soon I was singing and praying along with my friends. Tears of joy fell as quietly as I sang. I hurried to get to church one special Sunday morning and sat in my usual little corner. There was to be a special announcement today. Two of the brown men, Walter Fowler and Adam Craig, had met with the leaders and asked to have a place about the grounds of the chapel to bury their loved ones. You see, they were treated quite differently from the white members of the church. When someone in their family died, they had to bury them away from the church cemetery, sometimes near the edge of the fields where they worked or near their homes. They had heard about a place that was set aside especially for people of their color, but it was too far away. When the service was over, a man stood up to speak. He was one of the leaders of St. Mary's. He carefully explained that St. Paul's and St. Mary's thought it would not be a good idea to share the grounds of the cemetery. Instead, it was decided that they should have a church of their own. Walter and Adam thanked the leaders, then they all left for home. Later that day, many of the brown people met at Walter's home to talk about their plans. They were overjoyed about the announcement. Before the meeting started, we all bowed our heads in prayer and gave thanks to God. A message was sent to them that a lady named Eliza Hall had agreed to purchase a plot of land which was not too far away from the new chapel. It was located on a hill a little further down the road in Aquasco. They began talking about ways to raise money. I was very happy. A church of our very own, I thought. But who will sit in the back? <laughs> in the spring, a festival was held at St. Mary's to raise money. Eliza Hall paid $137.45 for the acre of land that had been promised. Many people gave donations. Even though I didn't have money to give, I gave a great gift. I prayed. It was with great joy that people in the community cut, sawed, and nailed boards together as they watched as the chapel was built. By the time it was completed in 1880, it had cost about $1,200 to build. I thought it was the most beautiful church I had ever seen. They named the chapel St. Philip's Aquasco. One Sunday in August 1880, the first service was held there. The first leader at St. Philip's was a deacon named Joseph Bryant, a colored man sent by St. Paul's. Bishop Pinckney came to baptize and confirm the members. Some people were received as members by the bishop. They had come from other churches. They wanted to become a part of St. Philip's. Getting to the new church meant that I had to leave home a little earlier and walk a little faster. But it was worth it. I soon discovered no one had to sit in the back of the church unless they wanted to. The chapel was filled with people every Sunday. 
It was the center of the community and God was the center of the church. The people of St. Philip's had a new life and they began to share it with the town of Aquasco. Many people came through the doors of St. Philip's over the years and learned that they were called the colored people and later African Americans, not brown people as I call them. <laughs> Some of their parents and many of their grandparents had come from a far away place called Africa where, they were, where there were many people who looked like them. To me, they were still brown people. There were many celebrations at the chapel. Things were especially beautiful as at the sea celebrations. At Christmas, the altar was filled with red poinsettias and lots of candles. For homecoming celebrations, they often set up a large tent and the children stayed all day long. I loved to watch the play, but I still kept my distance because after all, I was a mouse. <laughs> there was one priest I liked most of all, Reverend Small. He was in charge of three colored chapels. One was St. Thomas Prune, the second was St. Mary's Charlotte Hall, and of course the third was St. Philip's of Quasco. I used to hide in the back of his wagon as he visited the other chapels on Sundays. <laughs> the people always gave him food and fresh vegetables from their gardens. I enjoyed eating all the way back home. <laughs> <laughs> One evening after a meeting, the members locked up the building and went home. During the evening, something happened to the furnace and it caught fire. The beautiful chapel was burned completely. The next day, many people came to look. It was hard to believe the beautiful chapel was gone. Someone had placed a sign near the burnt remains and it read, Jesus wept. I wept too. I wondered, what will we do now? The brown people packed up the few things that had not been destroyed and moved back to St. Mary's. I went with them. I sat and watched the pain and suffering begin all over again in the same place it started. They worshiped there about three years. They missed having a church of their own. I heard some men talking about moving up the road somewhere. I could not imagine where that was. On moving day, I climbed into a box filled with books. Someone carried the box into the building and put it down. I stayed in the box until things got quiet. And then I climbed out and I looked around. So this was the new church. I paid attention to everything. There were beautiful stained glass windows, mm, stained glass windows just like the ones in the old church. I like that. There were rows of chairs instead of pews and the floors were covered with carpet. I wondered, I, I wandered outside. That's where I saw a sign. It read, St. Philip's Bay. I knew this was the new home and everything was going to be just fine. Amen. And now, my brown friends, my crusade with you has taught me much. I can truly say no book has ever been written. No human voice has described an understanding of your pain or your joy throughout your journey. I have traveled with you for many years, and now it's time for me to join my ancestors. I leave you with these thoughts. Close the books. Tune out the doubting voices and put your faith in God. He will never leave you alone. God speaks to you in many ways. Use these words wisely and strive to make your dreams a reality. May God bless you all. Love, Henry, the church mouse. <laughs>